Kevin, I want you to take the listeners of Mind Body Solution on a journey. And I think you do this very well with your books. Um, read many of them at the moment and looking forward to reading many more. Hopefully you, you come up with some new stuff in time. But you do a very great job with telling us the story of the origin of life. You, mm. you do this perfectly. I mean, you take us through how evolution wired us to be the way we are. Uh, from, from geochemistry to neurochemistry, talk to me about the story. If you could give me your best summary and take as much time as you want, by the way. If you yeah, could give yeah, summary right. of the origin of life to the human brain, take yeah. me on this journey. Um, well, let me, let me give you the motivation for that um, first, maybe, because, uh, you know, in approaching um, questions of, of human cognition and um, human agency and ultimately free will that the latest book touches on. Um, you know, the human brain is the most sort of complex instantiation of those things that we know of. And um, a lot of the work that goes on in, in, in human neuroscience, but also in, in the philosophizing about these things, was really centered on humans. And to me, it, it it makes the concepts really difficult to grasp because we have the most sort of complex instantiation of them. And it, it all gets kind of confounded with, with consciousness and morality and responsibility and freedom and purpose and meaning. It's, all, it's just very hard to get a grip on. And so what I really wanted to do in this book was actually just go back and say, look, maybe like everything else in biology, the only way to really understand um, these human faculties, cognitive faculties, is through an evolutionary lens. So, so let's see, rather than thinking, you know, in the abstract about questions of free will, you know, in principle, mm. let's look in practice, right? Let's, let's actually look at how these things came to be. Whatever we take free will to mean, um, and I would just say for the moment, our, our ability to make choices and decisions and control our behavior with some sort of conscious oversight and deliberation. So, um, if that's what we're talking about, then then we can ask, okay, well, how did that? How could that have come to be? How how did it come to be? What do we? What's our understanding of that? And so the story I tell um, absolutely starts with the origin of life, which you know maybe it may come as a surprise, uh, I think, to some readers. Um, but the reason is that if we want to understand what cognition is for, and how. Uh, being cognitive beings allows us to control our behavior, then we really want to understand, well, what, what is behavior? What does that mean? How does, not just how, how does a human do anything, but how does any animal do anything? How does that ability to act come about? Because for me, it's the main difference between living things and non-living things. Mm -hmm. And we hear, you know, if you open a biology textbook, it won't say it like that. It'll say, that, you know, the characteristics of life are, you know, replication and metabolism and respiration. And if you, you know, it'll sort of tick off these things of, of activities that are happening inside, inside organisms. But the bigger picture is that organisms are active in the world, right? I mean, they're acting in the world um, as causal agents. And that's something new, right? That was something that just didn't exist in the universe before life um, came along. And so, um, in order to ground the concepts that we're going to need later on to think about human cognition and so on, I wanted to start with just the simplest uh, things we could, which is really, what is what does it mean to be alive? What is How could that possibly have arisen? How could life have arisen from non-living things? And so, um, so that story is fascinating. And it starts, well, let me say the picture that I give in the book is, is a uh, clearly partly speculative, yes. um, and it's not my it's not my speculations. It's it's based on work of people like Bill Martin and um, uh, Nick Lane and and many others, right? So, but the question is, um, what does it mean to be a living thing, and how did that arise? And one way you can think about um, what it means, say even just for a single celled organism to be alive, is that it's a collection of processes. Right? It's, it's an active set of, in this case, it happens to be chemical processes, well, it's basically biochemical reactions or metabolism. Right? And so a single-celled organism is just a kind of a pattern of those processes to happen. So it's a very dynamic pattern that's contained within some uh, piece of the universe, you know, usually within a, a cell membrane, say. And 
importantly, that cell membrane means that that piece of the universe, what's going on inside it, is out of equilibrium with its environment, with everything else. Now, that's an unusual scenario, right? For, for that sort of dynamic um, pattern to keep going, it requires energy because it's an unlikely scenario from the point of view of the second law of thermodynamics, which just says things should get more disorganized. And here we have this organized thing and it's staying organized through time. So how does that happen? So the, the, the upshot really is that it needs to have some source of energy, of free energy in particular, that means energy that can be used to do some work, um, as well as some, uh, you know, uh, nutrients and, and stuff that it, the stuff that it makes itself out of, basically. And the, um, the very brief sort of version of the origin of life story that, that I recount in the book is about life in, in hydrothermal vents. Uh, not the not the real smoky big black ones that you might have seen that are in intense temperatures, but uh, ones that are much more sort of gentle, warm, warm hydrothermal vents. And these are perfect incubators for life because they have these rocky little tiny micro compartments that you can concentrate chemicals in. They have a flow of, of um, hydro hydrogen ions and other kinds of nutrients coming from the Earth's core. And... Uh, and, and within those, so that means there's a flow of free energy in a gradient, happens to be a gradient of hydrogen ions. And that means that you can get um, chemical reactions that happen in this concentrated little space that, that sort of build on each other and produce more and more complicated organic molecules using this supply of energy and carbon dioxide and so on. Mm -hmm. The ultimate idea is that is that those chemicals eventually included lipids, which would have allowed the cell membrane to be formed. And then, and then you have a little entity, right? It's not just a chamber where reactions are happening. It's a little entity that's creating its own barrier with the world. So in a sense, it's configured or it becomes configured to keep itself persisting. Mm -hmm. And the reason is simple, right? The ones that aren't configured like that don't persist. So it's very uh, tautological kind of logic there. Um, you just get selection for the ones that are the, the the sets of reactions that are configured in such a way that they reinforce each other, and you get this sort of auto catalysis. Right? So so you end up with these somehow these sort of free living organisms that are um, capable of keeping their metabolism going capable of maintaining these processes, these dynamic flux out of equilibrium with the rest of the environment. Now, that brings about uh, some interesting interesting concepts and new things. And one of those is that you've got this set, set of dynamic reactions, right? Mm -hmm. It is in a sense trying to persist in a, in a, yeah. a tautological sense. Now, maybe the environment might change, right? So, say there may be more of some nutrient or less of some nutrient or waste products build up or something like that. The, the um, Maybe oxygen levels get too low. It would be a good thing for that system to be able to reconfigure itself, metabolically speaking. And many biochemical organisms can do that. So they can switch from you know aerobic respiration to anaerobic respiration, for, for, for example. So... Um, Sorry, I'm just turning off that noise there. So with um, so that's good that they can can do some extra work um, to persist, but um, it, it's a bit precarious. And probably what happened at some stage was that you had you know RNA and proteins there, but eventually DNA was invented, for want of a better word, um, and DNA became a kind of a repository of the desired configuration of the cell, metabolically speaking, and possibly even of, of ways to switch between configurations. Mm. So you have this sort of invention of genetic material, which I'm just whizzing through here. Yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then another invention. So, so, so you've got free living organisms, they have a genetic material, that means they can not just uh, have this sort of reference template that, that uh, allow they can refer back to if they get um, disturbed in some way but it can be replicated mm. so now you get lineages of organisms that are uh, really importantly susceptible to natural selection because you get some variation in the, in the genetic material then you get some competition there's ones that are good at, good at persisting 
under some conditions versus others, they adapt one way versus another and so on. Now, uh, and I'll stop here after one sec because uh, I don't want to just go on forever, but um, one of the next really important tricks is if the conditions outside are changing or changeable, it pays to be able to reconfigure your metabolism. Mm. But also, sometimes that's just not going to do the trick, right? Sometimes that's not enough. There may be no food left and you can re reconfigure all you like, uh, you're just still going to die, right? So one way around that is to move, to move somewhere in the world. And that really is the invention of behavior, right? So moving in the world, um, and then you can start to say, okay, well, if I'm moving, which way should I move? Is there food over there? Is there excess, you know, toxic waste products over here? Then you can think about the, the importance of being able to sense things in the environment and then couple those sort of sensory, that sensory information to decisions about which way to move. Yes. So in the simplest sense, Right in the very very simplest sense of of, of uh, the simplest living organisms we know, there's already some decision making going on, right? There's and and it's already anchored by purpose. The purpose being to persist, right? So everything is has some value relative to whether it's good to for keeping me persisting or not. Mm -hmm. And then you've got you've got meaning and you've got information. And you've got action based on information about what's out in the world. This, this thing inside a membrane is kind of causally insulated in terms of physics and chemistry. There's all stuff, all sorts of stuff going on outside it that it's not, um, that it's not being affected by, mm -hmm. right? Cause of, cause of that barrier, but it can get information about what's out in the world and it can then act on that information. So for me, that's the start, right? That's the grounding point for the concepts that we need of purpose and meaning and value and decision making and action in their simplest forms right yeah. i'm not saying i'm not saying the organism is aware of any of that or yeah. it's thinking about anything right but the effect is it's making a decision that's adaptive for a reason mm -hmm. which is it helps it survive and that reason is configured into its biochemistry basically so so that's the story of the start and then you know you can probably see already the direction that that goes you, you just elaborate on that make it much more sophisticated um over evolution um the invention of multicellular organisms uh the need to you know actually invent nervous systems to coordinate all the bits of, of a multicellular organism and then extra sort of in layers of internal processing that really let true cognition get off the ground Mm. I, I, I know you, you, you emphasize this aspect of movement. I think at some point I wrote to note as well, you, one of your chapters, just by the way, for all the listeners and viewers, your new book is called Free Agents, and it's coming out, I think, on the 23rd of October, right? It's actually the 3rd of October. Yeah. 3rd of October, 2023. Um, everybody definitely read this. It's, it's amazing. At some point you mentioned, I move, therefore I am. So that is a very fundamental part of this process. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, you know, when we think about the brain, when we think, you know, what are brains for? Mm. If you ask people, you know, they'll, people will generally say, well, they're thinking, I think with my brain. Right? Mm. Uh, but then you ask, okay, well, okay, but what's thinking for? Yeah. And then you get, uh, you get to, to the angle that is, is the one that I'm presenting here, which is that the brain is a control system. Yes. And that behavior, the ability to move in the world is an extension of, the, the same kind of process of reconfiguring your, your physiology, whether it's a cell or, or an organ, right? what we call homeostasis, that is trying to keep everything within the set, healthy set points that you can persist at. And, and one way to do that is to reconfigure physiology, you know, when you're, mm -hmm. when you eat a meal and you, your insulin levels go up or whatever, um, you know, that's all part of your homeostasis. But another way to, to regulate, um, that is to, move in the world yes. so you know if you're if you're hungry you can eat something but if you don't have something to eat you can move to look for something right so um so thinking of behavior as a kind of a, a an act of homeostasis that's the point of behavior and then thinking about cognition in the service of that mm. i think grounds um grounds our concepts of decision making in in ideas that we can see are universal, even from, you know, they apply in even in simple organisms. Mm. 
Mm. Uh, and to me, I hope at least that that can sort of demystify some of the the idea of of, of human decision making, because otherwise we get lost in 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 the very sort of high level conscious deliberation that humans do, um, which is important, right? And ultimately, you know, we we can get to what what that adds, um, but ultimately, all of that is still aimed at or or comes from at least these systems that are for control. Yes. So Kevin, just to, just to wrap my head around it. So at, we've got these lower levels of what we'll call, let's say, proto levels of consciousness or proto free will decision making. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we don't want to give them words like purpose or awareness yet, but there's obviously a point where this proto awareness, let's say, is becoming a fully blown awareness. And yes. through your book, you obviously, it's, it's very difficult. I can imagine how difficult it is for you to summarize this because <laughs> yeah. your book is already a summary of billions of years of evolution. So if, at what point is this proto-consciousness or proto-free will slowly becoming mm. a bit of a more layered version? Yeah, it's, it's a, it, you're right. It is a tricky question. First of all, I, I guess I don't, um, I don't see transitions so mm -hmm. much. I mean, there are some, like the transition from you know unicellularity to multicellularity, for example, and then from things without nervous systems to things with nervous systems. There are some transitions like that. But, but you know, say if we start from things with the earliest nervous systems and go from there. It's more of a continuum, I think. Yes. Um, and, and one thing I should say is that, you know, I trace the evolutionary path along the lineage that leads to us. Yes. That's just one, that's just one path. And I take just a completely anthropocentric, egocentric sort of perspective on it. Um, that's a very good of course, evolution is branching, right? And so we've got whatever led to the you know the behavior that we see in say crows and birds uh, you know that can be very sophisticated or octopuses or insects they all have you know some kind of it's not just more or less agency or more or less sentience i think there are different qualities of of sentience and, and subjective experience of some kind across those different creatures um so along our lineage i think there were sort of several um, aspects that differentiated or uh, elaborated yes. um, as we got as we got more complex. One of those I think is really key, which is that if you look in simple organisms like bacteria, for example, when they you know they have sensors for things out in the world, they have motors that help them move around, and they have some sort of biochemical pathways that connect those two things together. So there is a pretty direct coupling of sensation and action. Right now, I don't want to overemphasize that because actually, within even a bacterium, there's all kinds of integration of multiple signals happening at once. There's um, integration over time, you know, based on what what was the recent past like, what's the current situation like, the comparison between those. So it's a very integrated, holistic kind of a thing. Um, you could call it cognition. It's a very basal proto cognition. Right. Um, basically, the organism is faced with a complex changing environment with lots of different factors changing, and it, it has to make a, an integrative decision about what to do. It's sort of a, a working out the utility function of all the things it could do, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not thinking about doing that. It's just configured in a way that that happens. And it's kind of like um, cybernetic systems. You know, you could think, okay, well, we have to do some missile guidance or something like that. You know, it's it's the sort of system you, you could build in a robot. Mm -hmm. And now it would be a complicated robot. You know, even a bacterium is a very, very complicated thing. Um, but it's not, there's not a multiple levels. There's not a lot of internal sort of reflection happening. Mm -hmm. and, and and you've got a pretty direct coupling from, from sensation to action. However, as you get more complicated, especially as you get... Um, beasts that have nervous systems, then they start to have sensory neurons, say photoreceptors, right? and they have motor neurons that control muscles. Now, you can connect those two directly if you want to, and you can get, you know, reflexes, um, you know, very fast kind of reflexes, like when I, you know, if you hit somebody's knee and the leg goes up, right? Um, I mean, it's a simple sort of a, a, a circuit, right? But, but you don't have to. Most of our nervous system doesn't work like that. Right? Um, and in fact, what you can get in those organisms is if you put some intervening layers of neurons in between the sensory neurons and the motor neurons, then you get this possibility for interesting cognition. So on the one hand, 
um, you've got sensory neurons. Um, and the job really that they're doing is to provide sensory data to the organism. And that could be photons hitting hitting some cell or uh, you know retina. Yes. It could be vibrations of the air that you're picking up with your or, or the water that you're picking up with your ears and mechanosensors. It could be touch. It could be sensory smell and chemosensory things. But all of that, the, the point of all of that is for the organism to figure out what's out in the world and what should I do about it. Right? There I should go towards it. Is there danger I should go away from it? That's the basic um, idea. And actually, even a lot of our behavior is pretty much approach, avoid sort of decision making, really, or explore, exploit kind of decision making. So, in if you look at the um, really simpler, you know, organisms that, that have smell and touch, what they're sensing is stuff that's very near to them, maybe actually touching them. Right? It's it's very close to them in space, which means it's very close to them in time. Mm. They don't, they don't have to think far ahead because they can't sense anything far ahead. There's no, why, why you know, there'd be no point in them thinking about what's happening over there later on, right? Um, because they have no sort of information about that. But once you get vision and hearing, those are distant senses. And there we can try to infer something about what's out in the world, which could be far away. So that's a job though, right? It's not easy. When we get photo, photons hitting our photoreceptors, that doesn't tell us what's out in the world. That's just a pattern of, of specs and, and light. We have to do a whole bunch of work to figure out, to infer what is out in the world. And so our, our visual systems, through all these successive layers that have built up, starting in the retina and then in, in, in visual, uh, visual cortex, is designed to extract um, things like edges and contours and do figure ground segmentation and object labeling and, and and eventually object recognition um, and all of that is in the service of letting the organism know what's in the world where is it what is it doing is it moving um, where is it relative to me and then it can decide what should i do about it mm -hmm. so you've got some internal representations of basically knowledge about what's out in the world or at least beliefs about what's out in the world they can be wrong of course, because that those systems don't always work right. So when you get to those uh, those systems, now you're doing some cognition, right? Really, some processing of that information. You're making some cognitive inferences. Um, you're holding. You have some men some neural states that effectively constitute beliefs about things in the world, and then it pays to develop the cognitive apparatus to let you not just react to things immediately. But think about things that are far off, like way over there, mm. right? You can see that now that's way over there, and it'll take five minutes or 10 minutes or an hour to get over here. Um, so it pays to be able to plan. And so the the, the sort of cognitive apparatus for those higher, higher order um, control of behavior, not just immediate reflexive control, but forward looking, proactive planning, um, co evolved with the, the sensory apparatus. That lets us see things in the world, infer what's out there, and so on. So I think that's a transition that gets, you know, we can follow. It gets more and more complex as we go along our our particular lineage, um, and ultimately it gets to, you know, the point where we're um, learning about the properties of the things in the world. Mm. Where when we see something out there, it's not just that we're segmenting the visual scene and this is a little rectangle and that's a little other you know circle or whatever. It's that we recognize the circle as a an apple, and we know from experience we we link that to our memory systems. We know that apples are edible. Uh, we know that it's uh, it's within reach or it isn't within reach. If it isn't within reach, we know what we have to do to put it within reach. Right? So you can start to build up these sort of levels where. Um, the the cognitive um, abilities become much more complex and sophisticated, and you can see the value of that, yeah. right? I mean, evolutionarily, that's just an extended form of homeostasis. It's a predictive form of homeostasis. It's like saying, okay, I you know I I can't get the apple now, so I can't do anything about my hunger right now. But if I move over there, I will be able to get it. Yes. So it's a prediction in the future 
uh, I will be able to achieve this homeostatic goal by doing this behavior and so on. So you get these, yeah, you get the ability to plan, you get the ability to have longer term goals, um, which kind of inform and, and constrain the, um, the actions that we prioritize at any, at any given moment. Mm. I mean, and it was clearly yeah. worth, oh, sorry, do you want to add more? Uh, well, that? I just thought, I mean, just when I was talking about the actions that we prioritize, let me just say one other thing, which I think is really, is really key because one of the things that really increases in complexity as you go along that evolutionary lineage is that the possible actions become more and more open-ended, mm. right? If you look at a wor like a nematode worm or a hydra or, uh, you know, simple organisms like that, uh, you know, a nematode can move forward, it can move backward, it can turn its head, it can turn around, it can mate. It's about like, it doesn't have many options. So its decision making machinery is set up to choose one of those, right? They, they're, they're, there's a set of possibilities in its action repertoire. And it chooses one of those to do. And at the same time, it inhibits all the rest of them. Mm. Right? So moving forward means not moving backwards at the same time. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, even a bacterium, it can move, you know, it can, it can go in a straight line or it can tumble around and do something random, basically. Right. Mm. So, um, so if you think about that, the idea there's an action repertoire and the, um, the job of the decision making machinery is based on whatever information you have, whatever your internal state happens to be, whatever your goals are to adjudicate between all of those possible actions and choose one and inhibit all the others. Now in us, all the others is like a possibly infinite array of things, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so um, yeah, so you get this expansion of, of cognitive power in parallel with this expansion of, a, of the behavioral repertoire of possible actions that have to be adjudicated between. I, th I think it's fascinating because, I mean, you mentioned the I wouldn't say limitations, but the differences between a bacterium and the way we function and all these possibilities, this extension, this expansion. When, when we when we look at the universe, or, or let's say when we look at planet Earth, and you think about the billions of bacterial cells that still exist, and then you look at the millions of humans that exist, you it, it, you tend to wonder about this this payoff. I mean, as a human being, the evolution of this, when you think, consider the fact that it's 2% of our body weight, our brain, and then... Yeah the expenditure of energy is 20 percent i mean yeah. was this an evolutionary payoff in the, at the end of the day considering there's still billions of bacterial cells yeah yeah well it's a great it's a it's a fantastic question right i mean i i you know i've been talking about increasing sophistication right it sounds like i'm talking down i'm talking down the bacteria um and you know i mean e coli is one of the most successful organisms on the planet okay. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, grass, grass does very well for itself. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, it's not doing too much, um, too much cognition. So, and, and, and of course, a lot of animals have pretty simple behavioral repertoires and pretty, pretty simple cognition. Um, so what was the payoff, right? Why is it that um, that increasing ability for, for increasing cognition was selected for? And it's a difficult story, and we don't fully know, but one answer goes like this that um, it, it grants us a kind of behavioral flexibility that other animals don't have. So an animal may be perfectly adapted to its niche. It has all the behaviors it needs in that particular niche because the environment it's adapted to and the environment is not changing too much from what it's adapted to. Well, <laughs> probably is now, but, uh, but you know, <laughs> up until now, right? Um, and so most animals are like that, right? They're really, really well adapted to their own niches but if you put them somewhere else they'll die now we're not like that right i mean that's the main difference that we have is that we're extremely behaviorally flexible we can adapt to all kinds of different environments and very dynamically changing environments as well and so um so what that means is that imagine you know you've got some some primates that are sort of, you know the ancestors of humans and chimps say which were probably much more like chimps um and they have you know they're well adapted to life in the forest or or maybe on the you know, on the savanna um but maybe some of them you know some something happens some mutations arise some some genetic selection for increased brain size and so on um where some of them start to be a little more clever they're a little capable of, of more um flexible behavior they can move into a niche that the other ones can't be in um and then 
uh, within that, maybe their ability to construct their own environment and control their own environment pays back, right, creates a selective pressure for greater behavioral flexibility and intelligence, which pays off in the ability to affect the environment or which creates a selective pressure again. So you get this sort of snowball amplification. So once we went into what's really called the cognitive niche, that probably became a self-selecting thing, right? Within that niche, intelligence is the thing that's that's most important for survival. And therefore it keeps getting selected for more and more, maybe up to the point where the energetic costs are simply too much, right? You talk, you know, it is 20% of our, um, of our brain capacity. And even, you know, even firing a single neuronal spike is really energetically expensive mm-hmm. from at a cellular level. So actually the, the brain is, is wonderfully configured to be as efficient as possible metabolically, biochemically, um, in terms of the information that's transferred and the information that's not transferred, um, in terms of the wiring. Um, and so on. So it, it does use a huge amount of energy, but thankfully it's, it's only 20% because <laughs> of all the efficiencies that are in there. Um, yeah, which, you know, which have really interesting payoffs actually in terms of cognition and computation. I mean, this next question is not in my notes, but it's something I'm thinking about now as we're talking about this. Do you ever think that this, this journey that's going on, because I mean, it's so out of whack if you think about it. Technically, I mean, we didn't need to really do this to continue to survive, but we are. Do you ever get this thought that perhaps there's some sort of a teleological finish line to this? Or maybe, we, maybe we're maybe headed to something, you know, like well, um, perhaps or something bigger than us. And uh, we're not really the most important part of the story. Yeah, I mean, there's two ways to think about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, one is that, you know, evolution is continuing. Um, and it may be that the, uh, you know, that, that the artifacts that we create will end up being more intelligent than us. That, that's quite possible, uh, given everything that's happening right now. I mean, I don't think that, you know, for example, large language mo- models are intelligent right now, but I don't see any reason why they couldn't, similar things couldn't be built with an architecture that is similar to the cognitive architecture that we have excuse me, but on a scale that that uh, so outstrips us without those power limitations, right? You know, without the, and without the data limitations, you can just throw all the data in the world at this thing. Um, so, you know, that's one possibility is that the, in the, the growth of intelligence will continue, not in our evolution, but in the evolution of our artifacts. <laughs> the other uh, possibility, which is looking scarily likely these days <laughs> is that we are on a, a uh, uh, on a course which is actually towards obliterating ourselves mm-hmm. and possibly a lot of the rest of life on the planet um, and you know we in a sense in a sense we broke free uh, from the confines of natural selection right I mean we we have transcended um, the biological world in that way we have dominion over it and um that comes at a cost if we are not exercising that dominion wisely which we clearly have not been so um yeah on a on a bad day on a on a depressed day uh i see that bleak uh future uh but you know who knows maybe the artifacts that we build um in ai will be just the things that help save us from ourselves um and um our our destructive greedy impulses (laughs) <laughs> For, uh, so when 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 someone truly understands the the background of this evolutionary story, I mean, it's so complex. You even mentioned the fact that when we think about a cell or a bacterium, it's easy for us to forget that it's it's so much more complex than we think. We 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 make it sound very basic, but yeah. in essence, this is a a huge universe in itself. Um, does the thought of what's happened elsewhere ever arise in your mind? Like, has this evolved somewhere else? Some sort of a a, an intelligent life or, or yeah, or yeah, yeah. Some sort of um, I mean, it's a really, it's a super, another super interesting question, right? Um, and so in some ways, if you look at life, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier, it's thermodynamically unlike, right? As a, as a, as a contained thing of, of, of an ordered set of, you know, dynamical processes that keeps itself going like that. It needs to take in energy to do that. And so it's sort of defying the second law of thermodynamics very locally, 
right? And you might think that makes it unlikely in a global sense to arise. But actually, in a global sense, it's dissipating free energy. It's, it's increasing the rise in entropy of the whole universe. And actually, globally, that should be favored, right? Dissipative systems. So if you think about, um, for example, uh, you know, when a whirlpool forms in your bathtub, when you pull the plug, yes. the reason that forms is that's the most efficient way to get rid of the free energy in the system as fast as possible. So physics generally should favor the formation of those dissipative systems. Um, so that's sort of one argument, which would say, well, life is basically a frustrated dissipative system, right? It's trying to get rid of free energy, but it just keeps getting more free energy, right? So it never it never blows itself out the way a tornado does. Mm. Um, uh, but you could say that they, they sh the, the existence of life should be favored on that sort of view of thermodynamics. But then there's a counter argument uh, or observation, which is that life seems to have only evolved on life on Earth once. Mm. I mean, we have a common tree of life. I mean, we're related to those E. coli. There's not separate branches. It's it's one big branching thing. Mm. So. Um, so why is that then? If life was is sort of thermodynamically favored, then why did it only occur once on Earth? And that's a mystery, and I don't know the answer to it. Yeah. Um, but it's then you, we have to think. Okay, well, okay, maybe it only occurred once on Earth, but there's an, you know an infinity, billions of billions of billions of of planets, uh, you know, in even just in the galaxy or in the universe. So it seems highly likely that living systems could have evolved on those things as well. Mm. Now. Who knows what they would look like? Because there are in our um, in our evolution a series of just contingent things that happened. You know uh, that you know that DNA was invented. Say, you know maybe that wouldn't happen somewhere else with some other chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, that the the event that led to the birth of really um, complex animals and plants, the, what we call eukaryotes. Mm -hmm. was this symbiotic event where one big sort of bacterium, you know, engulfed another bacterium, which eventually became mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, which gave these new creatures enough of an energy surplus to get genetically complex, right? Because genes, having a lot of genes is just energetically costly. Um, and bacteria, for example, have really streamlined genomes. They keep their number of genes down to a minimum, which means they're, they didn't have the the evolutionary space to explore, whereas eukaryotes did. So there's things like that that happened um, where, you know, it's hard to say what, I mean, even if you reran the tape here on life, it's hard to say that those uh, on earth, it's hard to say those would happen again. So, um, but yeah, it's a fascinating, fascinating question. Maybe someday we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll find an answer. At this point, it's highly speculative. Sorry, I, I, I seem to have derailed off the topic completely, but no we, okay, so we've got the story. So 13.8 billion years. Um, universe exists 4.8 billion years, give or take, um, life begins. And now we go on this journey, these proto aware, proto cognitive beings start slowly over a spectrum, as we understand it, become mm -hmm. us. And we've reached this point, let's say, before we continue, I think let's define the concepts quickly. Let's define free will and consciousness, and how you yeah. define and differentiate between these. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, the easy, the easy ones. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, let me start with free will. So the book really, um, you know, was prompted by the questions of, of whether we have free will. Mm -hmm. And what does that even mean? How should we even think about that? And, and, you know, oftentimes those discussions start with somebody saying, okay, well, define it. What do you mean by it? And I resisted doing that because I don't think we have a definition that everyone agrees on. Part of the, the whole disagreement is I define it one way, you define it another way. You say the way I define it is just doesn't count. And I say the way you define it is impossible. Uh, and then, you know, you never get any, right? Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do instead was hope to naturalize the idea, hope to come to uh, an understanding of what it, of what we're, what it looks like, right? What does freedom entail? What does the will entail? What does decision making entail? And partly the, the, the job there was to connect the philosophical literature, which is usually very abstract, with what we're coming to understand about the neuroscience of decision making, which we're learning, you know, loads and loads and loads about. And you would think that the free will, if you want to understand how you make choices and decide between things, that 
that that would connect with the literature on decision making, but it, it often doesn't. Um, so what I wanted to do was explore that. And by the end of the, of the book, hopefully come to a point where we kind of have an understanding uh, of a picture of it rather than a definition of it. Uh, but but let me say, but let, let's start, rather than with a definition, let's start with the phenomena. Yes. Okay, let's start, say, what are we observing that we think needs explaining? Um, and basically, I think what's a, what we observe is that we seem to make decisions. We seem to decide to do things. Uh, that's our own subjective experience. We see other people making decisions. We feel like we have goals. We can talk about those goals. We can, we can talk about our reasons for doing things. We feel like we do things for reasons. Sometimes they're very overt, deliberative ones that we can articulate. Sometimes they're ones where we could say, well, geez, why did I do that? And then we realize, oh, oh, yeah, I was thinking about such and such, you know, maybe a, sort of a subconscious thing, but still reasoned. Um, and even in simple organisms, we can say a bacterium has a reason to move towards a food source. It's doing that for a reason. And that's a perfectly legitimate use of that word, I think, even if it's not reasoning yeah. as a verb in that process. Right? Mm. So um, so for me, um, what defines free will in humans as distinct from what I just call agency in, in other organisms is this conscious aspect of it. Right. So we can do things for reasons just like other organisms can, but we can reason about our reasons. Right, we can think about our own thoughts. So um, when we, um, when an organism is, you know, has some sort of do, doing some cognition about objects in the world, uh, about its its goals, and, and you know, those are the signals. Those are the objects that are being operated on cognitively, and we do that as well. We have the same sort of circuits that are built there to carry information about, uh, you know, motivation, internal states, goals intentions, actions uh, that we want to complete, and so on. Percepts, beliefs, etc. But we have another level. And we have a level that lets us think about those objects as objects of cognition, right? We can think about our own thoughts. We have a kind of a reflective self-awareness. Um, and I don't want to sound, I don't want to make it sound like we, this is all solved, we know how this works. Yes. That's, that's just the phenomenon, right? The phenomenon is we can think about our own thoughts. And I know that we can because I'm telling you my thoughts right now, yeah. right? So the fact that we can communicate with each other, in fact, probably is a lot of the reason why those metacognitive um, skills emerge, right? It's the value of me being able to think about my thoughts. I can think about your thoughts. I can think, we can coordinate our thoughts. We can coordinate our action. We can communicate with each other uh, and do some, you know, we can go hunting together and I can say, wait, you wait here and I'll go there, right? Mm. So, um, so for me, I think the you know the conscious awareness of our own thoughts, a mental experience, there, you can see a selective value to it as this sort of highest level of cognitive control over our behavior that allows us to plan. It allows us to think, not just say, when I did an action. I mean, any organism has these systems that say, when I did an action, did that turn out well? And if it did, there's a reinforcement learning that means that the next time an animal is in that same situation or something similar, that particular action will be will be up upweighted as a possibility relative to all the others, right? Um, or conversely, if it turned out badly, you can say, okay, well, I'm not going to do that next time. So we do that as well, but we do something extra. We can say, well, okay, that turned out badly. Why? Why did it turn out badly? Was it just a bad thing to do? Or, you know, was I, did I have the wrong information? Was my information bad? You know, you can get a kind of a, a level of certainty about your, inf about your own beliefs. That, that's super, super useful if you want to do decision making because you're getting all this sort of perceptual information. You're drawing these inferences from it. But some of those inferences may be very, very certain. And some of them may be a little bit more tenuous, you know, it's sort of a possibility. Maybe there's a line. Maybe I heard the grass rustle. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was a flick of a tail, uh, but I'm not sure. So uh, if I'm really confident, I'm going to run. If I'm, you know, I think maybe it was, I might be a little more wary, but I'll keep, you know, grazing or drinking out the water and forward, whatever. Um, so, so those sorts of levels, uh, the, the ability for metacognition, 
becomes really, really useful. And at some point, and this is the really, really serious um, point, becomes what we experience as conscious subjective experience. Mm. And I don't know why that feels the way that it does. Um, I mean, you can talk about why certain things are the contents of conscious subjective experience versus others. And that's an interesting question, but it doesn't answer the question of why those experiences have a certain qualitative feel to them. Mm. Um, but maybe it's just inevitable that they do. Maybe you thinking about thoughts, maybe that recursive architecture just is looking at itself and that feels like something. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. But I mean, but what is interesting and what's a more sort of scientifically approachable question is to ask, okay, well, what, is, what are the contents of, of what you're thinking about, right? And you're not, for example, thinking about neuron, your neurons firing, right? You're not aware of that. You're not thinking about photons hitting your retina, mm. right? You're not making decisions based on photons hitting your retina. You're making decisions based on the inferences that have you've done all this internal processing about objects in the world and your knowledge about them and so on. Those are the objects of consciousness, right? Not the it, not the lower level neural firing and information processing that goes into it. So it can become interesting to think, okay, well, what would the objects of conscious experience be like in a cat or in a slug or an insect? Um, and it's hard to know, although we could say with some certainty what they couldn't be like, right? So a nematode can't be thinking about things far away from it mm -hmm. because it has no knowledge, it has no access to things far away from it. So, um, so I think that's an interesting way to think about consciousness as a as a as a filter right the sort of high level the need to know stuff that's in the all all sort of pulled together that the organism as a whole needs to have access to at the same time in order to make the best decision behaviorally right. in, in its environment right now right. um so i think there's a there's a you can certainly come up with an you know an evolutionary rationale for why consciousness evolved um yeah, the bit about why it feels like anything is is just a really well is called literally the hard problem. So yeah, I think yeah. it's 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 fascinating because when David Chalmers discussed this as the hard problem, you see how years later it's now become the meta problem. So it's almost like we we we're, we're constantly going to add layers to this. I, I often find this happens to me. I mean, my medical degree tells me that everything you're saying, I mean, clearly I believe it and I know because from my studies, it it makes a lot of sense. It it's practical. It works seems to be true. But then my philosophy degree constantly makes me ask questions. I mean, uh, do you think it often becomes a battle of semantics at that point, that there's no practicality? I think I saw you tweet, uh, mm. Philip Goff, about he's going to have that debate soon with Sean Carroll, and you were like, I mean, <laughs> is this is this as going to be as useful as your theory? Because yeah, yeah. it's not useful at all. Yeah. Um, well, that's a really good question, right? So, so is the theory, um, is it explanatorily useful? Does it explain what we needed to explain? Mm. Does it do an ex any explanatory work? And does it make any predictions beyond that, right? And that's what a good theory is. Now, um, I don't know if I would call what I'm what I'm describing a theory. Maybe it's a thesis. Maybe it's a sort of conceptual framework. I think that's more the way that I think about it. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you start with the phenomena that, that, that I described at the beginning, these feelings that we seem to be doing things, and yet... And yet, you know, physics is saying, well, how could that be? We, atoms are going to do what the atoms are going to do. And neuroscience is saying, well, okay, yeah, your beliefs and desires and goals are all nice, but these neural firings are, are where the real action is. You know, you're just fooling yourself if you think your beliefs are doing any work in this system. How could they be? They, is your belief pushing ions around in ion channels? That, that's ridiculous. So, um, so we have these, uh, these observations, these phenomena we want to explain. We have some challenges to them. And what I hoped to do in the book was present a framework that I think meets those challenges mm -hmm. and says, look, nothing in neuroscience or physics or psychology or behavioral genetics rules out free will of the, in, in the way that we're sort of commonly understanding. Mm -hmm. It may rule out the philosophical, abstract, absolutist version of free will, which I think is incoherent, actually, from the get-go. So if you define free will as being able to act free, absolutely free from any prior cause whatsoever, 
right? If that's your criterion for free will, then it's a nothing. It's a, what is that? What would that look like? What, what would an organism that behaves in accordance with that kind of freedom be doing? Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be doing, it wouldn't be acting for any reason, right? If you have a reason, that's a cause. If you, that's a constraint on your behavior, it's a good constraint, right? It's keeping you alive. If you didn't have those, you would never be alive, right? So organisms that just behaved capriciously or on a whim, you know, randomly with no, uh, with no prior causes would be acting with no prior information, right? And no constraint. So, um, and they wouldn't be, uh, they wouldn't be selves through time. I mean, the only thing that makes us selves through time is that continuity, right? That continuity of our genetics and our, all our, our, our experiences and all the evolutionary history that we, that, you know, that's our endowment, basically. Um, and everything we've learned and all our habits and our policies and our commitments and our psychological personality traits, that's what makes us us. Mm. And yes, those things do constrain our actions. They limit our degrees of freedom. But they don't say there's no freedom, right? They influence our choices. They don't determine our choices. Um, and without those things, there would be no us, right? So if you want to say, do we have free will? Well, the we part needs to find it in that, mm-hmm. in that question. Um, and I think that gets, that gets sort of glossed over in some of the arguments that people make where they're, they're basically asking for magic, right? <laughs> they're asking for, a, a sort of a dualist idea. So, um, well, Robert Sapolsky has a book out, uh, coming out yes. very shortly called Determined, which presents the exact opposite uh, view to the one that I'm articulating. And his view is that we've got all these prior influences that are shaping our brains. Um, and he's right, we do. Um, but, but he sees all of that as, uh, just, completely determining our behavior on a moment-to-moment basis, whereas I see it as influencing our behavior in a useful way. Right? And what he wants, so he, he he wants free will, he sort of sets a criterion, free will to be something other than all that biology, which to, to me is sort of uh, setting a bar that he knows is is incompatible with a just a materialist modern view of the world, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's asking for a dualist immaterial soul to be in charge and nothing less than that will satisfy him, it sounds like. Now, I see free will as a biological function, right? So all those systems of decision-making and perception and cognition and, and behavioral control are the machinery that we use to make decisions. And you can see that in a different way. You can see it as saying all that nuts and bolts is is making the decisions for us, right? It's pushing us around. We're not making the decision, it is. I, I don't see it that way. I see it like that's the machinery we're using to make the decisions. Yeah. There's nothing else that making a decision could involve or entail except some sort of machinery like that. And just because we find the machinery doesn't mean it's just mechanism and suddenly we're removed from the scenario. You know? mm-hmm. At some point in your book, you said, you say it quite eloquently, I think you say, instead of asking the question, what is free will? If you just rephrase that a little bit, you ask, why is, sorry, what is life, for example? If you yes. just phrase it a little bit, you say, why is life? Then you can come to the answer of life is why. Yeah, life is because it can be, right? I mean, that's sort of, um, yeah, thermodynamically, it's possible. And yeah. if it's possible, it'll happen. Um, that's the idea. And and yeah. you can say the same thing for this this sort of, progression i mean we talk about this why did this explosion into the cognitive niche happen because it could and and then once it did it created new possibilities that's that's i mean that's one of the really fascinating things about evolution it's not this predestined path it's each step opens up this realm of new possibilities that can be explored and new niches that can be exploited um, and so on so um, it's a very open-ended creative kind of endeavor yeah and so um you know you mentioned a, a little while ago your, your medical training and and practice right so one of the areas where this these questions about free will 
or just cognitive behavioral control comes into play is, is of course, in medical conditions. Mm. If we think about, well, things like drug addiction or compulsions, most obviously, but things like schizophrenia, um, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, um, you know, lots of, lots of psychiatric or neurological conditions where people are not as in control of their own actions as people without those illnesses. And, and for me, that's, that's just evidence that there's an evolved biological apparatus which allows us to perform these, these, you know, gives us these capacities of conscious cognitive control. And those, that apparatus can be damaged. You know, it can be damaged by disease. Uh, it, it, it simply varies across people. If you look at, you know, impulse control, um, conscientiousness, uh, the ability to delay gratification, the ability to plan, keep keep long term goals in mind over you know over longer times, um, those are all traits that vary between people, just like every other biological trait does. And of course, they vary across the lifetime as well. I mean, babies can't plan, right? Babies are just in the moment. They're either hungry or not. They're happy or they're not. Mm. Um, but they develop those things. So again, it's a it's a biological capacity that we can watch evolve in in real time in our children, you know, in, in, in babies. Um, and of course we have to um, work at it, right? Those are skills as well. They don't just, they don't just magically appear. They, they take practice like any other skill, you know, the ability of, of impulse control um, is a learned skill that has to be practiced over time. And it's one that, you know, that we instruct our children in because it's a pro-social sort of a thing is being able to not just act on every impulse that you have. Um, so all of that to me is, is just the reinforces the framing of free will as a biological capacity that we can think about in a naturalized way. It doesn't have to be mysterious. Uh, it doesn't have to be mystical or invoke any kind of immaterial dualist soul or spirit or anything like that. Um, but at the same time, it gets us away from you know, real hardcore sort of physical predeterminism or reductionism where, you know, you're, you're just sort of eliminating cognitive things like beliefs and desires and so on from your, from your ontology of, of what's in the world. Mm. Yeah. I, one thing I like about your approach is you try and avoid a sort of extremist view on, on most things, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you often, you, you try and find that balance and it's, it's, it's something that you can clearly tell from your book. I mean, you, at some point, before we move on to the naturalistic framework of free will, let's, let's, let's discuss the hard determinism versus soft determinism. Talk about yeah. those people like Dennett. I mean, he had just desserts with uh, Greg Caruso. I had him on the show. I mean, we spoke about it mm. because he even mentioned psychiatric disorders. And then to him, I mean, that will just sort of solidify the fact that we don't have it or there is yeah. nothing. So yeah, it's really interesting to see that, um, you know, it's quite common, I think, for people to look at the same data yeah. and draw very different conclusions. Uh, and like I said, I see that as evidence that it is a biological trait because it's clearly varying and can be affected by these uh, illnesses that affect, you know, particular parts of the brain and, uh, and so on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what I try to do, if you, if you look at the literature on free will, mm. there's a few sort of challenges to free will that are really different things, but they often get conflated and mixed together. And so at the very, very base level, well, let's go in reverse order. You can say, uh, first of all, like I'm wired a certain way. Why? Because of my genes, because of the way my brain developed, uh, because of all the experiences that I've had and all the learning that's gone on. But right now my brain is configured in a certain way and those configurations entail my preferences for behavior. So, Am I really free? I mean, I, did I choose? I did I choose any of that stuff? Not really. That's a bunch of prior causes that's constraining what I will tend to do, at least, right? um, to put it in the least deterministic sounding way. Mm. Okay. So, so we've got sort of that. We've got evidence from behavioral genetics, evidence from psychology. Just of, I mean, going back to Freud, of yeah, we have subconscious impulses. We don't always have access to them. Lots of our things that we do are motivated by things that we're not aware of. Now, you can take that too far. You can take that to mean we're never aware of anything. That doesn't follow from the fact that we're sometimes not aware of everything. <laughs> um, so, okay, but you've got sort of, you know, concerns from psychology and, and behavioral genetics that we're wired a certain way. 
which will just mean we'll have beliefs and desires and, and intentions that we really didn't decide to have. Um, so we're not completely free. But there's a level below that, which is the sort of level of really of neural reductionism, which says, guys, please, all your all these psychological terms, they're they're cute and all, but really it's just neural circuits firing. Look, I can stick an electrode in here, I can I can do my optogenetic experiments in animals, I can make it sit up, roll over, hunt, sleep, mate, I can change its cognitive uh, you know, decision making, I can make it more confident, I can make it more impulsive. We're, we're laying bare the machinery. What more do you want? It's just machine. Right? And, and there's a bunch of people who would say that. I mean, Francis Crick famously had a quote that really sort of lays that out, that you are just, are, are no more than the firing of all these neurons, right? Everything about you, your joys, your sorrows, your memories, is no more than that. all that sort of firing of neurons. Um, so that's a, a sort of eliminated cognition really, mm. and psychology altogether. But once you start going down that reductionist ladder, there doesn't seem to be a principled point at which to stop, right? Why stop at the level of neurons firing? Why not just say it's molecules whizzing around? Why not say it's biochemistry? Because all the electrical stuff is electrochemistry at the end of the day. And if you go down there, why not say, well, look, that's just physics, right? You're talking about atoms and molecules whizzing around. They're controlled by the laws of physics. How could your thoughts push atoms around? That's ridiculous. It's just absurd to even think that they could. Right? And, and in fact, nothing could except the basic forces of physics that we know about at the you know the level of the standard model of, of quantum mechanics and relativity and so on. Um, so, so there are people who would say that, yeah, physics is just completely deterministic. There's only one possible future. Uh, there was only one past. It was always going to be that way. There's no jiggling. There's no swerving. There's no randomness or indeterminacy ever that, that really is important. And um, everything is just sort of classically is determined at the classical level, at least that we're at. Mm. Um, and so I tackle that in the book. And, and I'm just going to say for brevity here that that's wrong. So uh, <laughs> the world is not deterministic. Um, I mean, quantum physics has shown us that, but, but the classical world only sort of mathematically works in a deterministic way if you take some mathematical abstractions and assumptions, which actually don't couldn't possibly hold in the physical world. Mm. I'll leave that as a teaser because it's it's a deep hole to get into. Okay. Yeah, it's um, it's a, sorry. Continue. No, sorry. I just wanted to say so. That's what I call physical predeterminism. Yes, the idea that there there look there's only one future possible because physics says so. So what are you talking about choices and possibilities? That's they, they couldn't possibly exist. There can be no action. There's no doings. There's just happening. And what happens is what was going to happen. You know, so, yeah. so the whole, the whole argument becomes moot if that's true. Now, thankfully, I think it's not true. Mm. Um, then the, the neural reductionism one is an interesting one. Um, one way out of that is to ask, okay, well, if you think all the causal power, is down here in these low level details of all these neurons firing. If that were true, then if I change some of the details of the low level neurons firing, then the behavior should change. I mean, if, if all the causal power is down here, then the details should be where the, where the information is that's relevant to um, how the system evolves. Mm -hmm. And actually you can show that's not true. That's not the way our nervous system works. We talked earlier about the energetic costs of sending information. And in fact, what happens as you send information from one neuron to another is a lot of that information is, is lost or better put, it's, it's filtered or actually it's integrated because you, you don't ever have a situation where you've just got one neuron connects to another neuron. Yeah. You've got this neuron here monitoring loads of inputs, right? And so what it's doing is taking some information from each of these inputs and it's integrating it to create a new level of information. That doesn't exist in these guys until this guy integrates it. Um, and that's a, a, um, a different way of thinking about what's happening in the nervous system. We tend to think of one neuron driving another, this forward way. Well, I think it's better to think of each neuron as looking backwards, right, at its inputs and making a kind of a decision, right? It's doing some computation um, to say, okay, well, if enough of my inputs are firing at the same time, then I should fire, 
But if only that guy's firing, then I won't, right? So that information's lost. So it turns out that a lot of those details, right, the, the meaningful, the meaningful um, causal units, if you will, in the nervous system are mostly patterns of activity. They're rates of firing over some period of time, not, not each spike. It doesn't matter what the pattern of spikes is. It matters that there's X amount per 10 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds or whatever the window is, right? Um, or in big populations of neurons, it doesn't matter all of the details of a thousand neurons firing. It matters what pattern, what global pattern those neurons fall into. And there may be some, what in dynamical systems theory is called attractor states. So, so global patterns where the population can be in this state or that state, but not any other state, right? Those are the only sort of stable dynamic states it can be in. And then you've got another population of neurons that's asking, is it in state A or state B? And that whether it's in state A or B is a criterion that's configured into the circuitry for whether this population of neurons does something or not. So the meaningful patterns in the nervous system are, sorry, the meaning is in the patterns of activity and the causal power is in the meaning, mm -hmm. right? It's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite of neural reductionism. Mm -hmm. Rather than saying, look, all these, you know, beliefs and desires, all the, all the sort of cognitive meaning and content of those, of those representations is an epiphenomenon. What matters is the neural machinery. No, it's the opposite. The neural machinery operates on meaningful patterns. That's its job, is to infer there's an object out there and it's an apple and I know about apples, right? Those are meaningful states. So um, so that's a an inversion, I think, of, of the neural reductionism. And actually what it says is, look, actually the details of the neural instantiation are somewhat arbitrary and they can change from moment to moment. That just doesn't matter. The details down that, le that level are not where the causal power is. It's the patterns that have the causal power because they mean something to the organism, right? They've been configured through its experience to, to uh, be used to inform action in, a, in an adaptive way. Mm. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question because now I forgot what the question was. So. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's fine. I think in the meanwhile, let's stick with this with the neuroscience behind this. And yeah. at some point in your book, you mentioned the fact that there's certain authors or, or scientists from the past, like Sachs, Kazaniga, Ramachandran, Damasio, who sort of set this baseline thought process for all of us, where when we go into this with the, with the thought that, okay, certain neuro proce neural processes work in a certain way, at some point, it, it, it slowly leads you into this thought that we're not in full control. There is no real agency going on here. And then you've got experiments. I mean, on the one side, you've got theoretical thoughts, like Hawking, Hofstadter, and then on the other side, you've got the practical one. So, so Libet, Penfield, um, okay. etc. Do you want to go through the differences of these and how, with those experiments, you're able to change the conclusion that you make? Whereas yeah. Those who um, don't? yeah. So, okay. So we've got two sort of things there. One is the neurological kind of evidence, and maybe I'll, I'll park that for the moment. But let's come back to it because it's really interesting. But let's start with these famous Libet experiments, which I think are just really, really overblown, really, really overinterpreted. So there's a scenario, um, your listeners may be familiar with it, but basically you're sitting in a, the, the subject is sitting in a chair. Their job is simply to move their hand like this whenever they feel like it, right? They've been explicitly told on a whim, whenever the urge takes you, just flick your wrist like that. They have a, a, a device that measures when they flick their wrist. And they're wearing an, an EEG, so an electroencephalogram that, that's recording brain waves. And that in particular um, can detect the activity over both the, the motor cortex, which is sort of sending signals, but also the premotor cortex, which is an area for planning to, to do an action. Right? So, so you're getting some information from the subject of when they move their wrist, just on a whim, getting information about their brain recording, and then you're also asking the subject to do something else. So they're looking at a clock and you're asking them to record in their mind on the clock where, where the hand was when they first felt the urge to move. And so what happens is you can see there's a, a preparatory brain activity prior to the movement, right? That's good. It happens before the movement. That makes sense. Um, there's a feeling of wanting to move before the movement. That's good too. 
the, the, the confusing thing, surprising, was the feeling to want to move was after the preparatory activity seemed to start, right? So the idea, right, the conclusion was you could see this activity ramping up in this particular part of the brain, the supplementary motor area, prior to even the subject becoming aware that they felt like they wanted to move and prior to the movement. The conclusion was that the brain was deciding and just telling the subject, the, cos the conscious self afterwards, just informing us afterwards um, about this decision. And then it was basically controlling the decision. Now, there's a whole load of uh, counter arguments to that. Mm. The first is simply that who gives a shit? Right, like you're not. This is not. This is not a deliberative decision. You literally told them to do it whenever the urge takes them. Right. So if if they just decided to let some system in their brain do a mental coin toss, then great. Like mm -hmm. actually, we have systems to do that. That like a lot of times we don't have a good reason to do one thing or another, but we have a good reason to do something mm -hmm. as opposed to just being undecided. Right. So many animals have a, a kind of a tiebreaker system that just says, okay, I've got two, two choices or more. I don't really care. I don't have enough information to make a, an informed decision. So I'll just, but I need to do one of them. So let me just pick one. Yeah. So maybe that's what's happening. Um, and in fact, there's some, there's some evidence that, that really there's some randomness in those brain circuits and there's a kind of an accumulator that allows a little bit of activity to reinforce itself in those circuits so that you can kind of ramp up until you reach a threshold at which you initiate an action. And in fact, another way of analyzing the very same data suggests that that's exactly what's happening because this gets a bit technical, but if you, in order to see those traces, there's so much background activity mm. that you have to do many, many recordings, right? Many, many instances of this. And then you have to line them all up uh, so that you can see this ramping up of activity over the general hubbub. So why? How do? You, what do you line them up to? The point of decision, the point of movement, right? And then you see every time someone made a movement, there was this ramping up of, of uh, activity, and it makes it look like the urge started here, because it's always followed by the movement. Mm. But of course it is, because you you locked it to cases where a movement happened. If you don't do that, then what you see instead, if you just have some arbitrary time lock timestamp and you lock them to that what you see instead is that well you've got activity ramping up and down and up and down uh there all the time so you can have little blips that look like the start of that what's called the readiness potential that never amount to anything right so the decision is not actually taken here it's taken when the threshold is met which is exactly when the people saying they feel the urge to do it and it's a point at which they can still veto it if they wanted to yes so they still had conscious cognitive control. Um, they really were just letting their brain do it because they didn't care. And in fact, there's another scenario, really nice experiments done by Yuri Maus oh, and Leah Diedrich recently, where they did the same setup of recording, but instead of a, just a whimsical decision, it was a decision that people cared about. They were, they were choosing between charities that were going to get money that they cared about. And there you don't see this locking to this random event because they're not using that randomness to just make a, a decision. Mm. So, um, yeah, so I think those Libet experiments just mostly just don't bear on the question at all. Uh, but if they do, they don't mean what people have taken them to mean at all. Libet, Libet's become like the Descartes for consciousness within the free will conversation. I mean, it's, it's, I know, it's <laughs> yeah, it is. And actually a paper just came out like two, two or three days ago that also suggested that in those experiments, this, this asking the subject to look at the clock and, and tell you when they felt the urge to move is actually a, a learned skill, right? During the course of an experiment, they, they get better at it or there's some <laughs> practice effects in it that actually call into question the data themselves, not just the interpretation of the data. Mm. So anyway, um, yeah, I, I always get a bit tired sort of talking about that because I just, I mean, it's important, right? Because it's out there and people think it's really crucial information and it just, it just isn't. Mm. Uh, but it does bring us back to the neurological thing because there's an implication from Libet's experience that your brain is deciding and then it's telling you. 
And so some of the neurology literature, like from Oliver, Oliver Sacks and Michael Gazaniga and people like that, um, kind of has the same uh, view, right? So you can have people who've had a stroke um, or people who've had like, you know, split brain experiments because they're for, for surgery, for epilepsy and so on, where things are happening in their brains that they're not aware of. Um, and what's often interesting is that when they do something, they take some some action, and then you ask them why they did it, they're not aware of why, right? They don't have access to that reason, but they won't tell you that. They won't often, often won't just admit that they don't know or they, they'll make up something. Like they'll make up some story. They can fabulate. Yes. And so people have taken that. It's a really robust finding, you know, really robust clinical um, finding. But people have taken that to, to mean that actually we never know what's going on. And we always confabulate. And our brain always decides and then tells us, and then we do some post hoc rationalization that bears little resemblance to the actual reasons that we had for doing things. And I just don't think that follows at all, right? Again, it's like the scenario we talked about earlier, where just because sometimes in some scenarios, especially with pathology, these people don't know what's going on and they make up stories, doesn't mean we always make up stories, right? It just doesn't, it's just a non sequitur. And in fact, you could say, well, you know, why would we even have that system for thinking about our own reasons if it was so crap? Right? I mean, if it was always just misleading us and not giving us any useful information, it wouldn't be adaptive. Why would we have and support the energetic costs of this neural machinery, our great big prefrontal cortex, if all it's doing is making up stories about things that aren't actually giving us actionable adaptive information about ourselves or about other people? So I, you know, I think about it the way I think about um, optical illusions. You can say optical illusions show us, oh, you know, your your visual system isn't representing reality because I can trick it with this, you know, particularly artificial um, stimulus. Well, to me, that's just saying that's showing us how the thing is working. It's not showing us that it's not normally working. It's an extreme, uh, exceptional s scenario that's informing us about the the biological workings of the thing. And uh, and you know highlighting some of the limitations in the same way that these neurological cases and psychiatric conditions and things highlight the limitations of the biology of our systems for cognitive conscious control and decision making. Mm. I, a lot of people when they t when they look at the hemispatial neglect patients the split brain patients yeah, um, yeah. several scientists philosophers often did include that there is this possibility that there's two entities or two conscious beings within the skull because of this. When you split the corpus callosum, you you sort of separate them. And once the connection is severed, there's no longer communication. Do you think that holds any validity? Um, I don't, <laughs> not, I'm not a huge fan of the sort of right brain, left brain, you know, left brain is the ra rational bit and the right brain is deciding things in other ways. I don't think it explains much. Some people, mm -hmm put that forward as if it's an explanation, they'll say, oh, that's your right brain doing this, that's your left brain doing this. Yeah. Okay, but that's that's not explaining anything. That's just displacing what needs to be explained to a different level, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, the, the split brain stuff is really interesting. And of course, because language in most people is lateralized to the left side of the brain, I mean, really strongly lateralized, like you can, in those split brain patients, you can communicate visually to yeah. either hemisphere, but only one of the hemispheres can talk back to you and tell you um so yeah i don't honestly i don't know what to think about that i don't place a lot of stock in it partly partly because it's so human centric as well mm. uh it, it sort of gets so disconnected from what we think about in other animals um that uh, you know and there are such there's such a limited sort of set of experiments that we can do that relate to it in humans that are these you know lesion patients or or really you know extreme surgical interventions um that we just don't have i think an ability to to, to have a robust enough uh, body of knowledge from of empirical knowledge at that level for me to really know what i think about it kevin how do you define your your view of is your view of free will in general i mean this naturalistic framework have you found a philosophical 
term for it. Have you have you given oh. it? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what <laughs> the one I don't, one ism. I don't know what the ism <laughs> is. Right? It's not so. It's definitely not compatibilism mm. because um, you know compatibilism, which would you know Dan Dennett is a famous uh, champion of it, is so he kind of comes to the same conclusion that we can make. Yes, that we at least can do things for our own reasons. Um, but he kind of concludes that, and yet he says, but we don't have choice in the moment necessarily, or at all, actually, he would say, because the future is determined. So, but we can think about a kind of free will that's compatible with our views of moral responsibility, even if determinism holds. That's, that's basically that picture. I don't subscribe to that. Mm. Um, I don't think in a deterministic world, you could have choices. It just doesn't make sense to think of choices. There are no possibilities. Why would life evolve? Uh, you know, it's, if everything was just sort of deterministic, why would this complexity evolve where macroscopic patterns are meaningful? Why would they be, right? The lower level patterns, all the work would be done down here always. There would be no scope for macroscopic complexity, in my view. There would certainly be no scope for talking about things acting or doing things for reasons. Why would they? Um, what's going to happen is going to happen. Right? Mm. Um, so I, so I don't, so I don't think um, free will is compatible with physical predeterminism. But thankfully, I don't think physical predeterminism holds. So that that does away with that um, burden. Um, now, the other sort of end of the spectrum is libertarianism. I think, mm. which is that we really do have this, you know, very absolutist kind of free will over our actions. I don't know if anybody really holds that view. It's very it's certainly not. You do find yeah, that. Yeah, it's not a view that I would hold because, like I said earlier, I think that absolutist um, condition is incoherent. Mm. I don't think we could be selves and have that kind of capacity. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, I don't know what to call it. Um, I mean, I kind of coined the term cognitive realism. I was just about point. to ask you about that. I was going to ask you about causal reductivism versus... Yeah. Yeah. Well, so for want of any better terms, I kind of made those up. Um, so on the one hand, you have this, this neural, neural reductionism, which says the causes are all at this the neural level, or you can go lower if you want to say they're all at the physical level, whatever. Um, those are basically eliminating cognitive states as having causal power by virtue of what they mean, mm. right? It's not the meaning of a state, then it's not the meaning of a belief that has any causal power. It just happens to be a neural pattern and neural neural things cause neural things to happen. Um, and what I articulated earlier is, is what I'm sort of <laughs> calling cognitive realism, which is saying, no, cognitive states are real. Mm. Those neural states have power because they mean something to the organism. Mm. Right? So it's, it's that inversion that I was trying to highlight by that comparison. Um, I don't know if those terms will stick. I don't know if I even really like them myself. <laughs> I, I, I think yeah. I think it's 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 always great to have one of those terms. I spoke. I remember when I this was a while back. I think it was last year. I spoke to Patricia Churchland about mm -hmm. Paul Churchland and herself when they came up with eliminative materialism, yes. and and that was just a. It wasn't the title they wanted to name it. They wanted to call it revisionary materialism because yeah. we constantly renew the sciences we learn. The folk psychological terms have to slowly change. But yeah. I had to pick a word, and they chose it, and then it just went down a rabbit hole of, of a lot of back. Well, and what, <laughs> well, and what happens is is that yeah, if the term doesn't fit, or if it has some connotations that aren't intended, mm. then it's not a good term, right? So, um, yeah, so I was worried that cognitive realism might imply some things to some people that I didn't intend. Um, Do you think it might add this layer of of of? giving thoughts almost an ethereal entity or giving cognitive processes some sort of an essence? Yeah, well, so there's this major problem, which actually a lot of the free will problem boils down to is the problem of mental causation. Mm. And, you know, this gets into this question, well, what do we even mean when we say something is mental? And people say, oh, there's the physical and the mental. What are you talking about? That It's so vague, right? Um, kind of it sounds like we know what we're talking about, but if pressed, it's really, really difficult to articulate that distinction in some useful way. So if you want to say, like, the problem of mental causation is this idea that how could the content of a thought have causal power in a system? Why does it matter what the thought means? It's just, 
you know, uh, it's some the, the meaning is immaterial. It can't affect the material physical stuff that the brain is made of. And to me, that's just wrong because a thought is not immaterial. If it's meaningful information, information has to be instantiated in some physical medium. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's the firing of a bunch of neurons or the configuration of a bunch of synaptic weights and, and connections between the neurons, or better yet, the firing of the neurons interpreted through the configuration of the weights in the in nerves. So, so a thought uh, is a pattern of neural activity and can have power in the system because of that. But then the then you're like, okay, well, yeah, it's just neural activity. I told you, right? Mm. But no, it's a pattern of meaningful. It's a, sorry, it's a meaningful pattern of neural activity, and it's the meaningfulness that gives it, it call, gives it its causal power. That's what I would argue. That's what the cognitive realism is arguing. Right? It's the meaning drives the mechanism, um, and I think that's for me, you know, a way to bring neuroscience and psychology back together again. Because it feels like, uh, you know, we started trying to explain how the brain sort of, you know, produces the mind or entails the mind. Uh, but it feels like we've been getting further and further away from each other mm. towards neural mechanism. Um, but, uh, but I think there's a way to bring them back together. Um, and, I, and I think that idea that meaning, meaning is what drives the mechanism is, is the bridge uh, between those levels, I, I hope at least. Yeah, I think, and it's important to know that when you're talking about information, you're talking about it in in very physical terms, like information. Yeah. Think of Shannon information theory. You you're actually discussing it in a very specific manner. You're not just talking. Yeah, about well, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, you know, information. Well, there's a whole you know technology and science uh, built around it, and it's really, really carefully defined, right? Um, so Shannon information is a way to define the quantity of information and the rate of transfer and the loss and, and so on, all those sort of signal transmission stuff. Um, Shannon's other term, which doesn't get talked about as much, is uh, it's relative information or mutual information, which is information in a signal that's about something else. And that's what the nervous system runs on, yeah. meaningful information. Um, now, meaning doesn't sound like a scientific term. Because you can't quantify meaning, you can't localize it. It's it's subjective. It depends on interpretation, um, and it doesn't feel scientific at all, right? It feels woolly and nebulous, and people are kind of allergic to it. Um, but it's what organisms need to get around in the world, right? They need meaningful information. So, um, but and there is a way to 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 cash it out in physical terms, in terms of a a correlation with something in a, in the world, right? So, if you have an internal representation. Um, Nick Shea, who's written about this a lot, talks about internal representations as being patterns that stand in exploitable relation to something in the world. So when I have this pattern in my brain that it, you know reflects a, a, an apple, represents an apple, that's because there is an apple in the world. And if I act on that reliably, it turns out there was an apple there where my brain said it was, and it really was an apple and I could eat it, right? Um, so that's an exploitable relation between a pattern that's inside your brain that the organism can act on in the world. Mm. And I think that way of um, of grounding all this sort of stuff that's going on in here, which is insulated from the world, through action and sensation, is is the key. And that goes all the way back to where we started, talking about you know these sort of direct couplings between something in the world and an action in the world. Um, and, and all that has happened in the meantime that doesn't have to be so mysterious is we've just added some layers. Mm -hmm. right? We've just added layers in the middle. They still refer to things out in the world. Uh, they still cash out in, in possible action, not obligate action, but possible action. And now there's this rich space in the middle where they also relate to each other. Right. So when I have an apple, I have all kinds of concepts that go along with it. it it's it's a fruit, right? I have a category concept that it fits into. Mm -hmm. Fruit is a food. That's a bigger category concept. Um, you know, I, it's an apple is throwable as well as edible. So there mm -hmm. are concepts of possible actions and affordances and so on. So you get this richness in the middle, um, but it's there doesn't have to be this mystery, this grounding problem. If you start, you start grounded. And then you decouple as you go from there, evolutionarily speaking. Yeah, it's. I mean, you. You. It's impossible to have a discussion on free will without discussing 
moral responsibility. I feel like most yeah. people have to approach the topic at some point. And yeah. so how, with your view, I mean, when you think about just desserts, the two of them started off with a very determinist view and then move forward one compatibilist, one hard incompatibilist, yeah. and lay forward a lot of arguments for the moral responsibility around that. How does your view justify your view on moral responsibility? Yeah, so, um, so my view, um, contra some of the people who are arguing, you know, against free will, like Greg Caruso is one, Robert Sapolsky is another um, current one, Sam Harris is another, for example. Um, my view is that our systems of thinking about moral responsibility and legal responsibility um, are pretty good. <laughs> We've been thinking about these problems for a long time. I mean, we have really sophisticated legal um, systems in place to judge you know was someone in control to what degree are they uh you know were they impaired were they under duress are they insane are they a juvenile whose brain hasn't matured enough yet um you know all of those things can be taken into account when we think about degrees of of responsibility for their actions um as well as everything that has you know their childhood experiences whatever has led them to be the way that they are all of that is taken into account already right and um, and I don't see the radical need to revise all of that or throw any of that out. I mean, there are arguments about retributivism, mm -hmm. say whether we, you know, whether our legal system should be, re whether retribution should be something we should engage in. There are arguments to be made about that. I just don't think they're informed by this idea of that neuroscience is telling us free will is not real, right? Um, so, so my view in the end is very similar to Dennett's position, although I arrived there through a different route. Uh, but ultimately, we, we both think that people are responsible for their actions. And one of the things I talk about in the book is, is that we're not just responsible for our actions in the moment, but we're responsible for our patterns of action over time. Mm. We come to be responsible. We come to have a certain character that defines us, that is partly chosen, right? It's partly through our own actions. It's not just, we talk about these past experiences as if they are things that just happened to us and they're not, we're making choices all along. Mm. We're choosing our own environments, but we're also choosing in a meta kind of a way, our policies, right? What kind of a person do I think I am? What kind of a person do I want to be? Well, once I know that, then in this given scenario, I'm gonna be constrained or informed to, to behave in this way versus that way, because I've already decided I'm the kind of person who doesn't steal things, mm -hmm. right? So that's going to inform my decision here. So there's these long-term sort of policies and, and characteristic adaptations to our environment that are informed by our upbringing, they're informed by our psychological predispositions and our genetic makeup and all of that. But ultimately, there's an inter prior causes and all of the actions and choices that we make as agents, responsible agents through our lives. So, uh, you know, the point that is that not only are we responsible, we're responsible for our responsibility, mm. right? We have all responsibility to try to be responsible. Yeah. And, um, you know, in a sense, that comes back to all of the things that society sees as virtues, right? The things that we try to inculcate in our children like patience and fairness and forbearance and temperance and prudence. And, you know, there's all these sorts of things that are really, they're, they're self-regulative behaviors uh, and they're pro-social behaviors, right? And that's why we call them good things. That's why we call them virtues and the opposites are virtues. And they require work, right? Children don't come ready-made with those virtues inbuilt, right? They're impatient, they're impulsive, mm. they're selfish, uh, and so on. So, um, yeah, so my view on, on moral responsibility is that um, it's something that we can build up. It's part of our evolved um, behavioral capacities that is really, really important uh, because we're so hypersocial, right? If we didn't have those systems of morality, which all ultimately hinge on these aspects of, of fairness and cooperation, social cooperation, th those are the glue that allow us to be such a successful species because we depend on each other so much. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I think, our first of all, our, our systems of legal responsibility are already very sophisticated. Uh, I just think it's really arrogant of neuroscientists to say, hey, look, my limit experiment 
says you have to throw out all your history of jurisprudence, uh, and you know that just seems a bit you know, hubristic. Mm. Um, but also, I think you know our, those systems of moral responsibility pervade everything that we do. Like all of our social norms and reactions and interactions are based on those norms of, of fairness and reciprocity and trust and, and so on. And um, and praise and blame are instruments that we use to reinforce pro-social behavior. And they work. And they work. The fact that they work is evidence that the what I'm thinking can in, influence my behavior. I mean, it's almost evidence of free will, right? Um, if I'm praised for something, I'll take that on and say, that was a good thing to do. And, uh, you know, and, and I'll do it again. So, um, yeah, and then we have, you know, these these sort of self-regulative systems of emotions, the, the sort of so-called moral emotions, guilt and shame and pride and so on, as well as things like frustration and satisfaction, which um, are anticipatory, right? The anticipation of guilt can guide our decisions. The anticipation of regret can guide our decisions. Um, and that becomes this, this forward-looking, metacognitive, hyper-social, moral reasoning capacity that we have. Um, and again, you know, some people have it more than others. Some people exercise it more than others. It's easier to exercise in some scenarios than others. Um, so, so, yeah, I think our, for me, the, <laughs> it's almost a letdown to say, here, I wrote this big book, and the, and the payoff is everything we thought about all these things is fine. Give it the same. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> but that is, I mean, basically, it's saying, yeah, we don't have to overhaul those things. Mm. I mean, we can, you know, we can maybe inform, and we, it's, they can be informed by you know neurology and psychology and things like that. Um, maybe even genetics in some cases, but um, they, th those things are not as radical. The conclusions from those sciences are not as radical as some people make them out to be. Mm. I mean, I know you're not an ethicist, but out of curiosity, if there were any things, anything that you would possibly want to enhance, implement any changes using this view, what do you mm. think those would be, if any? Have you thought about it? <laughs> I haven't. Um, that's interesting. No, I haven't really thought about it. So you've put me on the spot, and I don't know that I'm going to be able to come up with anything uh, intelligent. Um, to say on the matter, because like I said, my, my sort of the conclusion that I came to myself was that um, those kinds of decisions, uh, maybe they can be informed by some of the science, but broadly speaking, you know, we have traditions of ethics and, and uh, moral philosophy yes. and all sorts of pragmatic um, systems of ethics and, and law and morality in, in various sorts of um, arenas. And those have all been developed in a thoughtful way over thousands of years in some cases. Um, and yeah, mostly they work pragmatically. I mean, what I do tend to veer away from is any sort of absolutist view of, mm. of either morality or ethics. I, I think all of it basically comes down to pragmatics at some point of view and, and sort of collective views of what's good for everybody versus often versus individual goals that may be conflicting with that. And then we have some systems for um, resolving those conflicts mm -hmm. in some way, right? And we try to make them as fair as possible based on whatever conceptions we have of individual rights versus collective responsibility and so on. And, and you know, and those vary between countries and political systems and, um, and religious uh, beliefs and, and so on, right? So, I guess what I'm saying is I don't I you know between all the philosophers and theologians and sociologists and lawyers and, and all of those people yeah. <laughs> I, I don't I don't feel and philosophers I don't I don't feel um qualified as a scientist to to make any sort of claims that would override or or even really intrude too much on on that territory that they have been <laughs> thoughtfully working on for <laughs> centuries. No, that's fair. I mean, completely understandable. Just to, to, to touch on something, and maybe I can sort of nudge you into this, this conversation, but um, you've spent a lot of your time, you, when you talk about evolution and DNA and how it sort of wires us in a certain way, and obviously that's not the end. Once we're, once we're 
born. There's a lot that goes into it. Our developmental processes are a big part of shaping who we are. There is that nature and nurture aspect of it, but it's a lot more complicated than when people say that. Um, but then you've got a philosopher like Tom Nagel, who back in the day wrote about moral luck. And he spoke about, and it ties into your work because he speaks about different layers of luck, constitutive, circumstantial, yeah, yeah. and all these layers that some people like, let's say, Greg Caruso would then go in to say that, okay, we technically were never really in a position to have any of this work out the way we wanted it to. How, yeah. how do you go against that? Yeah. Okay, so there, so there, I think that that is a relevant um, thing where the, sorry, that is a, a point where the science is relevant, mm. um, where it really is informing it directly. So I absolutely agree that people's you know i mean my my, my previous book um, innate was all about how our, our genetics and just the random nature of brain development um you know does wire us with certain psychological predispositions and behavioral tendencies and capacities and so on um so we, we're not blank slates absolutely and we are wired in ways that it doesn't make any sense to take credit for frankly right you know if somebody's uh <laughs> you know more intelligent or more athletic, or more more musically talented, or whatever. Um, well, those talents are, yeah. You can, I guess, you can be proud of them without necessarily thinking that you earned them or take credit for them. I don't know. It becomes weird, right? Because we That's do, right? absolutely normal um, uh, for people to do that. And and you know, for example, this is very clear in the U.S. in particular. Right, where there's a, a an ostensibly very meritocratic view, mm -hmm. which is basically if I'm successful, it's because I worked hard, and uh, and you should be able to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, so we don't need a social welfare system or anything like that because you lazy so and sos just need to work hard like I did. Right, um, and you know it may be true that that person did work hard, uh, but it may also be true that they were lucky. Right? They were lucky in the circumstances they were born into. Uh, they were lucky uh, to, to have a certain level of cognitive ability or lucky to be born with a certain you know, level of conscientiousness or, or whatever. Right? Um, I think you can, you can take that too far because, mm -hmm. like I said, and like you just mentioned, there's this interplay between nature and nurture, which is not just, oh, I'm born with a certain way, uh, certain, you know, wired a certain way, and then a bunch of experiences happen to me. No, it's mm -hmm. like I do a bunch of things, right? If you if you view it from an agential perspective, then it's the organism doing things, the individual doing things throughout their life, and and they're increasing their agency as they go through life, right? Young older children are making more agential choices than babies who are having all their choices made by their parents. So so there's this growth of. Um, of your own choices and your own action, which is furthering the, the trajectory of your life. Now, you could say, well, okay, yeah, but ultimately you only worked hard at that because you were conscientious to begin with. And that would then that amplified this because you got praise for being good at school and that felt good. And then you wanted to do it more. And I think all of that is true, right? I think all of that is right. Um, so, <clears throat> So if you're interested in questions of moral responsibility and you want to look at this idea of moral luck, then I think there's an argument to be made there. Mm. Um, but again, I think, for example, our legal system already take that into account, right, to some degree. They do take into account people's capacity. They do take into account whether you should have known better or not, right? They treat a 14-year-old different from an 8-year-old. Mm. Because they should have known better, and we know that that's true. Right? Uh, but they also will will treat someone from a uh, you know they, they'll take someone's background into account and say this person was unlucky. They were they, you know they had bad experiences in their childhood, or they were unlucky because they were uh, you know they were they're they're intellectually disabled or you know yeah. whatever it is right. So um, yeah, I, it's a weird one because it's a, it's a very valid point. And I don't know how it gets cashed out, yeah. right? It's it. I guess my own sense <clears throat> would be that it's good to have some humility, right? Uh, and and I mean, I'm really aware myself of how privileged I have been personally, right? Yeah. 
um, in, in, in my life, in my upbringing, in the opportunities that I've had and so on, you know, all of which have allowed me to do the things that, that I've done. Um, and other people haven't had those same opportunities as me. And that doesn't make, you know, it doesn't mean I'm better than them because I've done this and they have done, haven't, right? Um, so, yeah, so I think some some humility on that front and some recognition that a lot of the things that, that happen that are, that, that one can achieve are due not just to, you know, personal endowments or social capital or various family things, but general circumstances beyond that, you know, social circumstances. Um, yeah, some, some greater awareness of that might go some distance towards, um, a bit more consideration mm. for others and a bit more of a realization that, you know, there, but for the grace of God go I, that, that sort of attitude. So, yeah, I don't know how, again, I don't know how that gets cashed out, except, except in different political systems where, um, you know, systems that are aimed at preventing those sort of social inequalities, at least to me, feel more fair. Um, but you know, you can have different attitudes where more individualistic ones feel more fair to, to some mm. people. I find, Kevin, there's a lot of when people discuss philosophical concepts, neuroscientific ones, etc. There's often this existential element to it. So, for example, any theory someone has it can either lead to some sort of a nihilistic view, optimistic one. It all depends. But I mean, with your theory, you think about it. Okay, there's actors in action. Um, this is a play, this universe. Uh, we often think this play is not really about us. We're just these side characters that are just going through mm. life. But with this view in mind, what sort of a insight or some sort of a perspective can come out of it that you think? Yeah. Would be well, the- I mean, first of all, I think that, that you know, we should avoid the, the nihilistic view <laughs> that we don't have free will. Because then, I actually, I don't know. I literally don't know how people who hold that view go through life. Uh, mm-hmm. It doesn't compute with me how i mean because basically i spend all day every day apparently making decisions or thinking about what to do thinking about why i want to do something versus something else or thinking about why other people are doing things that they do that that occupies most of our thoughts most of the time i think Mm. do you remember when we first spoke so sorry to cut you off do you remember when we first spoke you you tell me you're watching noam chomsky's episode and he says i mean the most common sense thing is to actually realize that everybody goes through life with the assumption that they have free will, even if they yeah. think that there's no such thing. Yeah. And so, yeah, so I don't know what it would be like to go through life <laughs> as, you know, I don't know, maybe I'll ask, I might have a chance to, to ask Greg Caruso or, or Robert Sapolsky someday soon, maybe, um, how they do that, right? How do they get up in the morning right? mm. knowing that all their choices are predetermined uh, when and yet feeling like they aren't, that just feels like a weird place to be. Um, but anyway, the upshot for me is that they're not predetermined, th- that I am in charge, that I do have some control, um, but also that I can recognize I have more control in some circumstances than others. Mm-hmm. And that actually, one of my goals, one of all of our goals, in fact, is to be in situations that maximize our controls, our control. There's a drive actually, for a, for autonomous agency. That's a psychological drive, but it's also, even in simpler organisms, um, there's a drive to sort of maximize the number of options that are kept open at any time and maximize the control, um, the, the, the autonomous control that's being exercised at any time. So um, you can see the evolutionary sort of rationale for setting up a system to be like that. And in psychology, it's interesting, the... the there's a, a phrase called uh, demand avoidance, mm. where if if we were going to do something and then someone asks us to do it, <laughs> then we don't want to do it. Why? We wanted to do it a minute ago. Now we don't. Why? Because it feels like we're not in control. And that's not a comfortable feeling. right? So, um, yeah, so I think we can be in control and we can also recognize scenarios where we're not as in control as we might want to be. Um, and we can maybe, you know, recognize conditions in ourselves that impinge on our ability for, you know, impulse control or that make us less patient or more reckless and impulsive um, that lead us to make bad decisions, right? Mm-hmm. You know, 
And um, I think we can, <laughs> we can all know the conditions that lead us to make bad decisions, right? Yeah. So whether that, whether that metacognitive awareness actually influences our decision to put us, to put ourselves in scenarios where we know we're going to make bad decisions. Um, well, that's another, that's another question, but it's open, right? I mean, I think that that's open to us mm. to think about those things. But um, I mean, listen, it's not, you know, I, I didn't write it as a sort of a self-help yes. kind of a book, but in the, I mean, yeah, just personally, I, I do think mm. um, there is a sense of in, in, in which being aware of these things is a, is, is maybe a sort of a window into greater self-awareness uh, that can be useful. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, I know that's why I prefaced it by saying, I mean, you're not an ethicist. I want the listeners and audience to know that, but it's always great to hear that there's some sort of a practical implication to it and yeah. see how it's how we can use it in a day to day life. But at some point in the beginning, you spoke about, we spoke about artificial intelligence. And I know in your book, at some point, you conclude with this with so, a sort of aspect of it all artificial agents. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's run through that a bit. Yeah, it was, I mean, so there's a little epilogue that I that I added about artificial intelligence and artificial agents, and um, it felt really timely to do that. Mm. Um, and so there's this huge debate in, in the artificial intelligence community about what what intelligence is, um, how do we build it, and you know there's there's various reasons to want to do that. One is that we get this technological things that can do stuff. The other is as a research project as part of understanding cognition and understanding neural systems, we build artificial ones and they're uh, and, and as a test bed, right, for yeah. our theories. Um, so the systems that are all the rage these days, these large language models like ChatGPT and um, uh, DALI and those other things, right, those, those are um, absolutely incredible. And they have what looks like understanding almost, but it's not. It's not understanding, right? Yeah. And, and you can push them a little bit out of their comfort zone and they they tend to fail right they're they're they don't generalize to new situations at all really and the reason is because they don't develop any abstract understanding of things a kind of an abstract web of knowledge because they don't need to right mm -hmm. they have all the data that they want they have all the computing power they need and they can just deal with lots and lots of, of de details um, and they abstract things like categories Right. Uh, so, so visual, you know, visual recognition programs, abstract categories of, you know, a chair or a table or a person or a car or whatever. But they don't think about causal relations between things because they don't have to. Right? They're not, that's not, not, not what they're for. Um, and also they don't really have access to that because they, they can't causally intervene on the world. All they have is statistical correlations. Now, those correlations themselves embody a lot of causal regularities mm. but they also embody a lot of correlations that aren't causal and the system can't tell the difference between those things right because it can't do a test it can't take an action look at the effect and then learn something about that that's what organisms do mm. they accumulate causal power because they act causally in the world and they pay attention to what happens so they build up this web of causal knowledge of causal relations and they use that that's power to act in the world adaptively. So the question that I kind of raised in the epilogue is, well, okay, well, what would it take to make an artificial intelligence that can do that, an artificial general intelligence? Um, and ultimately, I, I sort of propose that actually you might need to make it an agent. Mm. You might need to make something intelligent. You may need to build an intelligence, an entity that acts in the world, right? That maybe have to be embodied and could be embodied in a simulated world, yes, uh, but it should have an opportunity for causal intervention. It should be able to explore in a proactive way. You may need you may need to give it a kind of a utility, a master utility function that it can scaffold other goals on. I mean, our master utility function for living organisms is to stay alive and reproduce. It could be something like that for a an artificial agent. It doesn't have to be. It could be something else, uh, but it feels like you would need that. And I think you'd also need some some looseness, some indeterminacy in the in the detail. If it's too deterministically set up, it it won't ever develop these levels of abstraction and meaning mm. that would allow it to act for its own reasons. So you know, it, it kind of comes down to the idea that intelligence pays off in action, 
Mm. Right? When we say somebody's intelligent, well, often it means they've done something intelligent or they do intelligent things. They're not stupid, right? They don't do stupid shit all the time. <laughs> uh, and by stupid shit, we mean like walking out in front of traffic or, you know, blowing your money on things that that are not going to pay off or, you know, th things like that, right? So um, the payoff is in adaptive, appropriate adaptive action. That's the payoff for intelligence. And uh, these artificial sort of models that we have at the moment just don't have the opportunity for adaptive action because they don't do anything. They just have they just have an output. Um, so I think it's a really interesting time in artificial intelligence. The computing power is there. The architecture, I think, is not sufficient mm. to get a real agent or an, an intelligence out of it. But I don't see any reason in principle why you couldn't build Yes. something that has that architecture if we do all i mean all this neuroscience and cognitive science and psychology is showing us what the architecture looks like right what are the operations that are happening is weighing different options having a kind of a a, a space of suggestions that, that pop up and then weighing between them based on motivations and doing reinforcement learning I mean, all these different bits of the brain we're getting good handles on on that what that architecture looks like where that cognitive control comes from you could there's no reason why you couldn't build that, model it in, in silico. I don't think there's any magic about the wetware yeah. necessarily, right? I mean, you, we don't know. Maybe there is. Mm. Um, so it seems perfectly conceivable that you could build an artificial agent. Um, and then I think, if I recall correctly, the last line of the epilogue is the, the next question is whether we should. Yes. Because <laughs> that raises all sorts of, of um, practical issues and ethical issues and moral issues as well. Mm. I mean, deciding whether to put it on in the first place, and then you also have to decide whether you want to put it off. Yeah, mm. exactly. It, it, yeah. So there's a lot of work being done on that, on, and it's called analog AI. And, mm -hmm. and they, they're using a lot of work, but done by people like Andy Clark. And when you think of 4E cognition, yeah. and you, you take this embodied being, put it in, embed yeah. it into an environment, allow yeah. it to continuously enact upon it, and then yeah. extend it somehow. And I think that yeah, is that's correct. I think at some point that probably will be the trick. Yeah, I think so too. And the question is whether the way that they're doing that now has the necessary architecture in it to enable this level of sophistication of action and adaptive control to emerge. And I, I think it doesn't yet. Mm -hmm. But that's the, but I think that's the right approach yes. is, is exactly that inactive, embodied uh, agent interacting with its environment mm -hmm. uh, because that's where the meaning comes from. Right? We talked about that grounding of the meaning through adaptive action. Um, yeah. So it's a very exciting time, I think. Yeah. You know, there's this potential convergence between neuroscience, cognitive science, and artificial intelligence and artificial life, which doesn't get talked about very much, but is a huge, huge mm. other sort of area of artificial life. Um, and it feels to me like those things are going to come together at some point. They're not quite yet. They're sort of on the verge of it. Um, but yeah, very exciting times and, and, and sort of ones that raise all these ethical issues that we're going to have to tackle. Probably better to think about them before we're forced to think about them. Yeah, no, exactly. By, by events. Yeah, no, Kevin. So when I made this podcast, it was just a great way I felt to explore, I mean, the nature of reality, consciousness, free will, morality. I mean, we've, cut, we've touched on all those topics. Um, yeah. And it's also just an opportunity for you guys who, who write these amazing books, publish papers, articles, scientists, philosophers, to just highlight their view and give you an opportunity to express it. Is there anything on your mind that you feel like it's something your book doesn't say perhaps or something you didn't cover that you want to just clarify before we finish? Yeah, no, you know what? I think we covered a lot. I mean, there, there were great, um, great questions. I really have enjoyed the discussion. I think it, you know, we probably ranged over uh, touched on lightly in some cases and a bit more deeply for, for others, you know, all of the major themes and, and concepts of the book. And I think, um, you know, hopefully I've gotten across the, the perspective of the framework that I'm trying to, uh, trying to present. So yeah, no, I really appreciate it. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. No, thank you so much. I mean, are you going to, are you going to settle on cognitive realism or <laughs> going to give that? I don't know. We'll see what the reaction to that is. I, I, you know, I all, all the people listening and watching, I'll give the, give us your views. <laughs> yeah, I, I floated that. So we'll see if people uh, like that or not. Maybe it'll be like eliminative materialism and it'll get, <laughs> I'll, I'll get pilloried from on high. Um, we'll see. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm not married to it. 
I, like I said, I just couldn't think of anything better at, at the mm. time. It reminds me of Keith, uh, Keith Frankish when he made illusionism as a theory. Yeah. Of he, he actually wanted to call it magicism, I think, or something like it's something different. But he's I think his publishers wanted to go for illusionism. So sometimes and, and, and I think that he's not so happy with it. I don't I think, think so, thinks, yeah. I think he thinks it's it's misleading. So yeah, that's, that's the danger. Tracking. But yeah. yeah, I mean, actually, to be honest, I'd rather just not have <laughs> talk about isms at all. But I realize Sometimes there's useful. It's a useful shorthand to describe it. It is. It just allows people to communicate, and and also in the, at the end of the day, I think it just becomes a lot more memorable. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Mm. good branding. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, Kevin, thank you so much, and also thank you for the uh, name. I mean, I often have to introduce myself as Kevin with a T. So yeah, good. <laughs> so uh, thanks for that as well. All right. Yeah, great. Well, it was my pleasure. Thanks a lot. Cheers, Kevin. Take care. Okay.